Uh, welcome to Castle Derby's TV. It's Gareth Cavanagh. Hello, sir. Hello. Welcome are you doing? to my island, sir. Welcome to your island, the yeah. Lasso Gallery, yeah. the finest pub in Manchester. Thank you yes. so much. So, yeah, so yeah. I've only been there too. Uh, better, better than me. Uh, right, so we're uh, here to talk about a few things. Yeah. Uh, mainly, I think, probably your Chris Boucher Fest. Uh, Bouchfest, I hadn't thought that. Bouchfest. Bouchfest. Brilliant name, yeah. Yeah, we're having that. Robots of Death. Yep. And Stormmine. Stormmine, yeah, correct. Stormmine is the fifth in a series of excellent audio spin offs. Mm -hmm. Cowboy City Audios from about six years ago. Yeah. Were they big finish? No, they were done by Magic Bullet, which was Alan Stevens and Fiona Moore. Don't shoot me if that's wrong. Okay. I think it's right. Um, and they're really good. They're, 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 it obviously uses this fa fabulous world that Chris created for Robots of Death and yeah. spins it out. So you have robots, sand miners, and intrigue, and, um, and a very interesting big bad appears, okay. which I don't believe anyone could see coming for a million years. Very exciting. It takes it into a very weird twist. So Stormmine is almost like um, a dreamscape. So it's set in a sort of, you're not, it's never made clear whether it's reality or a dream, or um, the unconscious mind, or something in between. So it's, it's already quite ethereal. Uh, so the idea is that Robots of Death goes straight into Stormmine, and right. this will make perfect sense. Because Robots of Death, of course, doesn't have the Doctor either. It has. For obvious reasons. Yeah, well, obvious reasons that Chris Batch doesn't own them. Although Chris did think he owned Leela for a bit. Yeah. But he doesn't. There's a, there's a lot of story behind that. Dear Chris. But. So instead, we're using the two leads from um, the uh, Calvary City, which is Castaniago, memorably played by, by Paul Barrow, yeah. the British Shatner, as I like to be. <laughs> and uh, Tracy Russell, who is Elsa Blaze. So these two appear. And if you can imagine Back to the Future 2, where they go back yeah, yeah. and it's different. Blaze and Iago wake up on the storm mine. And if you could imagine suddenly waking up, it, this is obviously the most notorious murder site in Cardinal City's history. If you could imagine waking up in uh, 18, 1888 London, yeah. Jack the Ripper, you know what's going to happen, but now you're a part of it. If you're on the wrong street, you could get murdered. Right. So that's what it is. So it's Robots of Death as you know it, it's Robots of Death as you don't know it and the two work together. They work remarkably well. So it's full cast, yeah. proper um, production, very much like Midnight and Halo Jones. And that's taking place here? Um, no, it's a co it's a co-production with our good pals at Fab Cafe. Mm -hmm. So Robots of Death is going to be at Fab right. the first week of July. Storm Mine is here at the last in the second week of okay. July. And for one day only, there's the world premiere and Paul Darrow's coming to play Castaniago on stage with Tracy Russell playing Elsa Blaze for one day only. Yeah. So with the rest of our cast, mm. with them. And after that, it's after that, it, it's it, there's a new Blaze and a yeah. new Iago. Yeah. Okay. We couldn't afford the money for him to do that. <laughs> um, lovely that that would have been. Yes. So yeah, this is just so Marvel cool. Stuff. Yeah. Marvel stuff. stuff. Yeah. So this is our little little you know. And this is about the uh, Manchester about the Great Manchester Fringe, very yeah. first Great Manchester Fringe. So. Yeah, first of July for the Darrow event, and this is this is really the premiere. So exciting stuff. Yeah, yeah, thrilling. Um, so, and what else have you got? Uh, like as part of that? Well, we've got um, the lovely Philip Martin, of course, uh, creator of Gangsters, and we know him and love him as uh, the writer of Avengers of Paros, yeah, and the marvellously potty and slightly confusing Mind Warp, Mind Warp yeah. and, um, and a big Finnish audio Creed of the Cromon. Ah, right, um, yeah. But I think we'll mostly be chatting about Gangsters, potty but brilliant, which of course introduced us to Maurice Colbert. Yeah. Um, very much the template for Lytton. In his later, basically, in Britain, in the seventies, with strange dream shapes, um, and of course, um, Varos and so. So, yeah, Saturday the twenty-first, Philip will be with us. That's twenty-first of July. Right? First, twenty-first of July. Yeah. Um, so what else do we have that will be of considerable interest? We have a brand new adaptation of Nigel Neal's View of the Sex Olympics. Yeah. A brilliant play in which. That clever, clever man accurately foresees uh, reality TV. 
Um, and a uh, trash society where the TV execs just put on rubbish to users. No, that would sit, never happen though, would While we sit at home eating crisps and, and, and watching the box. Yeah, it would never happen. No, that's outlandish. No. outlandish. Do, you, do you partake in this habit of uh, watching TV with Twitter? Yes. Do you? Yes. I quite famously um, am known to imbibe a few foaming treats and watch a James Bond film on ITV4. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Moonraker. Yeah. Brilliant. Do you I like Moonraker? I love Oh, it's dreadful. Oh, don't do it. He's got some very good bits in it, but the whole thing is. I'll tell you why I do it. I'll, I'll, get, I'll give you five reasons why Moonraker. Five? Five. five. Yeah. You can do better than that. I'll also tell you, uh, but I also like the trash, but I'll tell you what. Uh, Matt Lonsdale's Hugo Grant's best one day. Okay. Yeah, suave, sophisticated, appears to be quite a canny businessman as opposed to some of these loopholes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> knows, his, knows his onions and has the best line ever. It has several best lines actually. He has, may I press you to a cucumber sandwich? In the whole um, afternoon tea thing when he goes, ah, at last, England's. Unquestioned contribution to world culture. Afternoon tea. <laughs> <laughs> May I press you to a cucumber sandwich? He's brilliant on that. And there's, um, it's got Jaws in it. Mm -hmm. And Jaws is very funny. Yes, and actually, you root for it. You do. So that's two. Three, the special effects are brilliant. I love that whole space station, space battle. It's cool. Um, four, I watched it when I was six, which is the perfect age to watch a Bond film, yeah. so for me it's, it's turn the magic. Um, and five, um, Ball's Q, Bolus 007. It has the best Q Bond sequence for me. What are we up to now? Three? I think it's yeah. about five. But no, you've got the five without mentioning what's he doing, I think he's attempting re-entry, sir. Yes. Which is the only good thing about the film, That's which is fine. basically the spy who loved me in space. Yes, it is the same ending as the spy yeah. who loved me, and a few of them have the same ending. Um, now, Moonraker rocks. It's um, it's, it's cool. To, it means it's got Rio Carnival in it. You know, it's um, oh oh the, the the Venice scene in the gondolas where. Um, where, where they're chasing him with the knives and, and he throws a knife back, bloke drops in the coffin, coffin floats off and they've got Alfie Bass smoking like a million Rothman super kings and then he sees the coffin float past and goes <laughs> yeah. chucks it away. Mostly it's actually for, for Michael Lonsdale. Yeah, he, he is good, I want to argue that. I think it's probably the first one I watched all the way through when it was first shown on TV, uh, probably 1982 or 83. I'm sure we all recorded it. I don't know if I did, but I remember being James Bond the next day. In school? Uh, no, I think it was on during the holidays, so I think I was James Bond and I was making one of my cousins be... Well, I always think I was, one, I was one of them weird kids in school. Doctor Who from weird kid in school. No. Mm. Um, I always wanted to be the Bond villain. Really? I remember in Star Wars I was the only kid who ever wanted to be Moff Tarkin. And, uh, and I, I probably was Drax. <laughs> yeah. You may fire one ready. See that some harm comes to Mr. Bond. Um, do you know the big problem with Moonraker is that uh, the spy who shagged me has killed it. Do you think that killed it? Yeah, freaking lasers and all that sort of stuff. Mm. So when he goes, prepare to laser spacecraft. Yeah. You can't help but, mm. but yeah, here, Doctor Evil. Yeah. <laughs> is, um, We've really digressed. Though. We have considerably. Is there any more Doctor Who related content? I can speak some of that off. Um, that goes a cult. <laughs> More Doctor Who related stuff, uh, or sci-fi related, or genre related stuff. Yeah. Uh, well, it's Together in Electric Dreams. Of which course. It's a nerd feast. Yes. Which is, um, we have thrillingly cast a brilliant Sir Clive Sinclair and a brilliant Alan Sugar. Yeah. Better known as Lord Sugar. Lord Sugar yeah. himself. The Apprentice. This is amazing. I was delighted when he told me about this. Oh, this, well, this could, it's so, the script is laugh out loud. What it is, basically, is in 1986, um, Alan Sugar swooped in to save Sir Clive Sinclair's computer empire, and by mean save, I mean he bought it. Um, so, and Clive was a couple of days off going bust yeah. because he the C5 had been a, a vast flop, and the Sinclair QL had been uh, not very good. What was QL? The QL was the machine that came after the Spectrum. 
it was supposed to be Quantum Leap, which is right. it's, he brilliantly announced without having built. So he announced that they were going to launch this machine at this price, and then went away and built it. Right. And of course, it didn't really work. Right. So they're a bit rubbish. And so those two killed him. Spectrum, great little machine. So all, so what happened was, is Robert Maxwell was supposed to swoop in and say, really, and then he dropped out. Because, because he had Microsoft, didn't he? Yeah, he had yeah. Microsoft, didn't he? You know, and um, but Sugar got involved, mm -hmm. and they had two meetings, and the second meeting was over a business lunch. So we've gone, well, let's dramatise that business lunch. So we've done a lot of research. Um, I've read some very good um, Sinclair boundaries. I've been buying interviews as Clive did at the time. I've been, you know, buying ludicrously expensive copies of Reader's Digest, which had Sinclair rambling on in them, and um, lots of time on YouTube. Um, people keep saying to me, oh, has it? Yeah, oh, they did that a few years ago, Micromen. It's like, no, they didn't. This is after that. And this is Alan Sugar and Sir Clive. Two great icons, but very different. And they meet in a restaurant, which actually happened, mm -hmm. and we dramatise that. This is where they cut the deal. And it's basically two very different people. It's someone who's in it for the art and the aesthetic. Someone said to me once that if someone had said to Supply, the name of the game is to make money, he'd probably be alright. Yeah. Whereas Sugar's all about the cash. Mm -hmm. Dosh, 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 money, money, so, money. So, yeah. And so, in some ways, they're polar opposites, but in many ways, they've got a lot in common. Um, so Clive never went to university. Both have beards. Both have beards. Um, we've interviewed people who've worked with both of them. Right. I've interviewed uh, the head of um, his, Sinclair's ex-head of manufacturing, David Carlin. Right. He was very interesting. He gave some good insights into what it was like at the time. And brilliantly, um, John Matheson, who was one of the Sinclair developers, because as soon as Sugar buys Sinclair, he just sacked everyone. Really? Because he just wanted the spectrum. And the brand name. He didn't want, yeah. as he put it, the company and the problems. So well, he cross comp. They, they became cross compatible, didn't they? This, the 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 Amstrad machine and the Spectrum machine. The Spectrum ones. Were no, they just looked the same. Were they not compatible no. at all? I'm sure there was some level of of compatibility later on. Maybe later on. Yeah. Maybe yeah. later on. No, he was a dosh, 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 dosh. But they're, they're fascinating characters in their own right. They're both titans, but they're different. Right. But they're same. They never went to university. You think Sir Clive is going to be this, you know, yeah. bookish, you know, sensitive, you know, um, university don? Yeah. No, never went to university. Right. Left school at sixteen, had an interest in, in microelectronics, and um, self-made man. Well, that, that, I mean, that's no difference to Steve Jobs or, or Bill Gates, because they both dropped out of university. Yeah. 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 Fascinating. So it's on. Oh, it's so funny and. Um, um, some of the guys we interviewed, like John Matheson, told us a great anecdote which has made it in where this was a couple of years after and they went in to interview Sugar, freelance work, and went in and Sugar sat opposite them and they set their stall out for the work they wanted to do and halfway through Alan Sugar went, hell on a minute, went in his briefcase got a check out, I mean, he'd already written the check out for what they were going to get, and they went, oh yeah but, uh, no, I've already written the check, that's what you get. Oh, but, 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 no. Shall I take it away? <laughs> I don't think so. And, and, and yet they said it was impossible to negotiate at that point. They said, because it was a good sizable amount. But, he said that's what you get in. Yeah. So that's gone in. Um, the other thing that's very interesting about Alan Sugar is um, two very good tales. The first is that at Amstrad Towers, he sat, his desk was in the middle of the office. And he made everyone else sit round him in a circle with their desks. Right. So he could swivel round at any point, see what you were doing, and point, shout, point, shout, what are you doing, what are you doing, what are you doing, what are you doing. And and it, a hard man to work for. Yeah. Um, the other thing that, that that one of the guys we interviewed recollected, he said, what was bizarre is that almost everyone who worked for Alan Sugar as a manager all looked like him. So they all had curly hair and beards. Beards, and, really? Yeah. Yeah, so there was a real... So they're interesting, because they both seem to have personality cults as well. That is weird. Mm. That's very strange. But it's a very, very good play. Together Electric Dreams. And that is on... That is in... Um, that's at the last gallery, and that is in the first week of July. Okay. Only on for um, four dates, bound to sell out. Sounds great. Oh, yes. So we've got that. Um, I'm sure we've got... 
Christmas. Um, oh, porridge! How do we Porridge, of course. Porridge, porridge. Well, this month we're doing whatever happens to light you Yeah. Writer Dick Clement has very kindly allowed us to do these for the first time ever. Okay, which episodes? Uh, we are doing uh, Rough Justice and Poetic Justice, two of my favourite, where uh, the device, of course, is it's the judge that sent down Fletch is sent in your side as a crook. Um, you know, perverted course of justice, whatever these, these judgy sorts of things. And it's two episodes that run together, and wonderfully funny. And what's great is that I have this fear of, of just running set up episodes because I sometimes think they're boring because they're trying to put too much across. So rather than do the first episode of Porridge and the second episode of Porridge, this, everything's already set up. But because the judge is inside, you still get an introduction to what it's like to be inside yeah. for the first time. So the, the first night with a cell door closes. Uh, Mr. Mackay, has got some lovely funny lines. Beautiful. So that's going to be here in the first week of July and the third week of July. So that's it's going to be good. That's what we're going to do. Well, how can we go wrong? Top scripts. We've got um, a good cast coming together. We've got a good track record in um, sitcoms because we've already done uh, Rising Down and Frost, Step yeah. and Sun, yeah. and now we're doing Lightly Lads. Oh, we're doing The Good Life at Christmas. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Christmas episode? Yeah, we've got the rights really? to do the Christmas episode. Oh, excellent. So that'll be um, an hour long total treat. I think so. Well, that's excellent stuff. Well, thanks very much, Gareth. My okay. pleasure. Um, always good to speak to you. Of course. And uh, I look forward to the magazine. We don't talk about magazine, though. Many. Thanks very much, Cheers, love. Cheers.